Hello, everybody. Welcome along to the latest episode of the La Piedra podcast with me, Sean Woolley. I'm the Managing Director of Claret Now in Spain, a real estate company based on the southern coast of Spain. And with me, my partner in crime, oh, shouldn't be saying that, uh, Mark Stucklin from Spanish Property Insight. He's the guy, the go-to guy for data and analysis of the Spanish market. And Mark is often featured in some of the leading media outlets, including things like the Sunday Times. So he is the, the go-to guy for, for this kind of thing. And just to remind you, the reason we, we started this podcast was to try and give a balanced view of where the market is, where it's been, and maybe where it's heading based on two fronts, really. Mark's expertise with the data and the analysis and my uh, experience of what's happening on the ground with uh, with real live people and situations. So welcome again, Mark. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Nice dull day up here in Barcelona. Oh, it's nice and sunny down here. We, we had a little bit of rain for, for a week or so, which um, I hate it when people say, oh, we need the rain. <laughs> yeah. I know we do, but it's still never, never nice. But it's uh, yeah. back to a bit of normality now. So what are we going to be discussing today then? Well, I thought we'd talk about some data I, that was published last month, which I wrote about last month, which um, came from a property portal called Idealista. It's uh, the biggest, I think, in Spain. Yeah. And they published data on the listing times that we, we um, that we see in the um, in the uh, well, how long listings stay in their database. Yeah. And um, so listings could be up for one week, or up for a month, or three months, uh, or or a year, or more than a year. And they 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 kind of said that this was the same as sales times, which is not true. Uh, there's lots of reasons why listings can go up and down and there's lots of duplicate you know uh, listings can go i don't know if an estate agent just gets a, a new listing puts it online but it was already listed with another agent sold the next day it goes down straight away um, yeah. but that doesn't mean to say that it only that it took a day to sell it might have been on the market for six months it, it's not very it's not a a, a very accurate um um, guy, but it's the best. But it's the best we have because there is no other data on how long properties take to sell, other than your own individual for you know in different uh, agencies who who collect that data they might know. So sure. so anyway, that was what that's what there is, and so they provided this data, giving breaking broken down by by province and and provincial capital and with a Spain average, uh, based on uh, listings in their own database in December, and that showed, for example, that. As, as a for a Spain average, twenty percent of listings were only uh, up for one week, and so if you infer from that that that's how long it takes. So, so you know, twenty percent of properties sold in a week of being mm -hmm. advertised, thirty-five mm -hmm. percent in a month, fifty-six uh, yep. percent in three months, and eighty-five percent in a year. So that was an average for Spain. Um, and you know, there's something to benchmark yourself against if you're yeah. if you're um, if you want to sell a property. We're, we're, let me just specify: we're talking about resales here. We're not we're not mm -hmm. talking about new developments. That's a whole you know, it's a different different uh, ball game. Mm -hmm. So if you have a property to sell in Spain and you want to know, and you know, people who do come, so they they want to know how long it's going to going to take to sell because mm -hmm. it's something that's mm -hmm. important to them. Um, and you know, trying to sell a property is a it's quite a big job. Um, yeah. it's something you want to get once you've made the decision you want to get it done as quickly as possible yeah. basically yeah. at the best yeah. price that's the sort of best price as quickly as possible that's what absolutely you want to absolutely so um, just before I before I start picking your brains on this let me just tell you what the same data showed for the Costa del well Malaga province so that mm -hmm. would be um, Costa del Sol so Malaga province once again 20% of listings were uh, disappeared in a week so mm -hmm. let's say 20% of property sold in a week and 36% sold in a month, 58% mm -hmm. sold in three months and 89% sold in a year. So it's very so, similar. Yeah. Quite similar. And, and then there's a big spread between, um, I don't know, the best is Granada uh, in, uh, for, for the whole of Spain. It goes from Granada province, which is also in Andalusia, your, your neighbors down there on the mm -hmm. uh, next coast along. And, um, there we see, um, let me just organize this data by, by year. So yeah, in Granada capital, so, uh, properties, 97% of properties are sold within a year. 
mm-hmm. um, which is the highest in Spain, and 34% sold in a week. Um, and at the other end of the scale was uh, Teruel province with only 50% of property, just over 50% of property sold in a year. Right. Um, right. So, so there's a big spread. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess within those, obviously within those provincial figures, there's going to be, like we've discussed before, there's going to be markets within markets within markets, you know, as, as, yeah, which, which is so hard to, to get the data for. But those figures yeah. are really interesting. And I think, you know, you've, you've just said earlier that it's difficult to sell uh, a property to, particularly to a foreign client base. It's not, you know, we get a lot of clients from England, for instance, questioning commission levels here. And mm-hmm. the, you know, the simple fact is that we we have to we have to go to a global audience. We we can't, you know, just satisfy ourselves with sticking a, a, a thing in the window and hoping for the best and putting it on right move like you do in the UK, where you know that people are looking for that specific street or that specific village. It's a different ball game here because clients very often are not specific specific to a, an area or a street or anything like that. They're quite happy to look around and and then you've got. You know, you've got so many markets out there. So it's it's that's why it's expensive and it's time consuming and it's um it's confusing and it's fragmented and it's it's a very, very different market to a to a, a home residential market, I would I would say. And those um those figures are interesting. And we we you know we all, all always take on listings that we feel we can sell. We don't list for the sake of vanity like a lot of agents do, they just want hundreds of things on their books. I don't need the hassle of 100, you know, 200 vendors phoning me up every day asking why I haven't sold their property. So we tend to, when we get uh, a vendor coming to us and saying, can you come and have a look at my property and see, you know, see what you can do with it. We go with, well, we go with a very open mind, but we go with our, our facts and figures as well of, of, you know, what's on our shared system, what we think, you know, we know that things have sold for. And then we'll give them a, a guide price on what we, what we believe they can achieve based on, the historical figures, but also based on the the look and feel of the apartment, which is incredibly important. Um, the presentation, the location, the orientation, the views, all those little sort of micro details that, that you need to consider. And when we give a, a valuation, um, normally the you know the client is is content with that. It, it normally accords with what they're thinking, but occasionally, uh, particularly in a market that's got a little bit heated over the last few years, a little bit excitable. Uh, you can get vendors who say, well, no, I, I want more. I want more than that. And and <laughs> I know that there are some agents out there who'll go, great, fantastic. Yeah, we'll list it at that. And and um, they get it on the books, beat all the other agents to it. And then over time, of course, the price comes down, the price comes down. Yeah. But at least that agent has the listing. We do it in a different way because we haven't got time or the energy to play games like that. So we just say to a, to a client, look, this is worth, I don't know, 500,000 euros. And if the client comes back and says, well, I... I think it's worth 700,000 euros. We'll say, well, in that case, you know, it's not for us because we don't think it's mm-hmm. worth that. And we lose listings that way, but we would rather be honest and open, you know, transparent about, about how we do it. As I say, there are there are, well, a lot of agents who go in there and just, just you know, will tell the client, the vendor, what they want to hear. Yeah, of course, your property is worth 700,000. In fact, I think it's worth 800,000. Let's put it on at that. And they will do that just to get control of the listing. And then over time, they will let the client down gently by saying, oh, sorry, I think we, I think we were a little bit hopeful on the on the price. Let's bring it down to seven. Then it goes to six. Then it goes to five. And by that time, everyone's kind of bored of seeing this property. And before mm-hmm. you know it, it's gone down to four. So it, it can be false economy sometimes. Not always, mm. but it can be, it can be false economy. But it's it's very interesting with the the time scales because I've, you know, we discuss it in-house all the time, me and my, my sales team, you know, um, how can we how can we move our listings? How can we you know what else can we do to try and to try and shift them? And it comes down to you know supply and demand basically. You know we've got listings in developments that have a paucity of listings, so maybe one other competitor in a beachside development, and we know that there's interest in that development, and we know that we're going to sell it. So we had one a few weeks ago in Alcazaba Beach in Estepona, very very nice development. Uh, ticks all the boxes basically and we we got a listing uh which we thought was a, a fair price and we sold it within a week uh, because there's always people looking for that development and there was a lack of of competition within that development we had another one a penthouse at 1.5 million somebody bought it via a virtual viewing that had been on for less than a week but somebody was looking specifically for a penthouse in that building and we put it out to all the agents and there was one agent who had that client looking for that 
exact property basically we had the property and we did a very quick deal over the over the telephone so those deals do exist but they i think if you're going to sell that quickly you have to be in a what i call a prolific development or a prolific area where there's always constant demand and you need to time it right you don't want to be going to market when you've got you know 20 other competitors basically all your neighbors are for sale as well because you lose control of the price the best time to go to market of course when you you know when you want to sell is when there's a a, a lack of stock and a high demand and if you time it right you should be able to sell very quickly so that's the primary example of why things go quickly or why things stick around you know it might not be a prolific area and you might have to wait for that ideal buyer and you might have to adjust your price and you might have somebody put their property on the market at a more competitive price and it's a better property and then you kind of have to wait for the natural order of things to to take place so that one has to go first and then Mm -hmm. you've got then you've got control of the market and again we're very honest with with vendors if if we know there's a better priced better property around the corner we'll say that's your competition and very often the competition is a new development uh, so mm-hmm. we'll go in and say look you know your competition is this development around the corner it's shiny it's new it's they've got a show home you can walk in and smell the coffee and there's jazz playing and it's amazing and here's your place it's 20 years old it's grotty <laughs> the bathrooms and kitchens need doing how are we going to compete and you either compete on lowering the price or you have to do some work and a lot of a lot of people we find a lot of second homeowners don't want to do that work they don't want to invest 10,000 euros to get 50,000 back and very often it's a case of that very often to compete with someone who's made that effort or a new development you have to spend a little bit of money particularly if your property is over 10 years old for instance because there will mm-hmm. be things that are out of date and you get one chance to impress and we always say to people you know like there's a villa around the corner and it's like a brown color and I said to the I said to the owner because he can't sell it. And I said, Have you ever thought about painting it? You know, I did it in a nice way. Have you ever thought, just not mm. paint it? I said, Have you ever thought mm. about painting it like a cream or a stone color? No, no, no. I like the brown. I said, Well, mm. I'm telling you now, if you, if you paint repainted that house and remarketed it, you could probably get a hundred thousand euros more than what you're asking for. Mm-hmm. And he just he can't see it. He just can't mm-hmm. see it. He, he likes the brown, and that's that's mm. fair. That's fair enough. But. You know, we're the experts. We've been around for 20 years. We kind of know what works, or we think we mm-hmm. do. We, well, I hope we do. Uh, mm-hmm. But if people don't take our advice, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, yeah. No, I get the point about, you know, segments. Uh, it's very easy to talk about. Like I pull out some data, and 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 that data is very kind of, uh, you know, the Spain average. But it all really comes down to segments. And like you say, if there's much competition in that segment, if there's much liquidity in that segment, I mean, you can see it straight away in the data that the capitals have better sales times and slow and quicker sales times than provinces because capitals tend to be more liquid markets. There's more buyers and sellers in the market, and that and yeah. there's and there's so there's more turnover and things move move quicker. But so it it, it really does depend on. And then you get down to the specifics of a property what might have some absolutely knockout, um, you know, killer characteristics, a fantastic price, well staged, all sorts of things. But mm. generally speaking, to give uh, listeners an idea on the cost of soul, and let's say, I don't know whether it makes much of a difference between apartments and villas and, and you know, the t- types of uh, property. But what's the sort of if you've got your asking price? Yeah, uh, more or less in the in in the market in in the in the right bracket. What's the average time that it takes from like okay on the market to let's say to signing a reservation, some sort of commitment from a buyer? Maybe not to completion before notary, but just to like okay, I've got it, I've got it, I've got a deposit on it, I've got a, a reservation. What what's the I, average time? I would say between three and six months is is the average and clients always ask us this question and of course we never commit because you can't and we have we have listings that stick around for no reason you know stuff that we love and we push it and we we market it and the, the photos are done the videos are done and just, they just don't get a bite and i always say to people look if we're getting if we're getting viewings and the price is right mm-hmm. if we're not getting if we're not getting viewings and we're doing all that effort and marketing if we're not getting viewings from that then there's something off with the price Mm-hmm. If we're if we're getting viewings but no offers, then there's something wrong with the property. Mm-hmm. There's, some, there's yeah. something we need we need to look at, and that's you know the basic the basic rule. But I always say to 
to people in this fragmented market where 70% of, of transactions are done with more than one agent involved. So someone will have the buyer, someone will have the property. Make sure that your property is, is opened up to the masses so that people can see your, your property, not just on our website, but also on the shared agent uh, websites that we all have access to. So the other agents, that agent down the road who might have the client for that property, make sure that they're seeing it as well. So it's very important who you instruct and how they are going to market your property, whether they're going to open it up to those people um, or, or, or not. But yeah, you know, as I say, we get stuff that sticks around, we get stuff that sells like that, and we just didn't mm -hmm. expect it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's no there's no hard and fast rule, but I would say on average between three and six months. But you know, Okay, if, so if, yeah. if it's taking longer than six months and, it, and it's there's nothing obviously undermining the sale like some legalities or so then you, that would suggest that people there's something wrong in the mix that they've got the either the presentation is very wrong or the asking prices so so if in six months you haven't got a property sold um and according to the data that we were discussing earlier you know almost 60 percent of properties of listings are 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 down within three months and mm. so i guess where i want to go with that is okay let's talk about the asking price specifically because i've always understood that it's very important to get your go-to-market asking price right because if you mm. get it if you go too high then you're you're going to end up selling it's going to take you longer to sell and you could well end up selling for lower than you could have for less than you could have got if you'd gone to market with the correct price yeah. so it's actually a really important decision to make the, the go to market asking price if you're a vendor. Um, and I would argue that it's better to be on the depends on the market cycle as well. Are you in a, in a, in a like a, a buyer's or a seller's market, but it's better to be, um, I mean, you know, if you're not trying to waste time and you want to sell and you want to get out and move on with your life and get the capital for other projects or whatever your personal reasons, you're better not ask, you're better going erring on the side of, of uh, lower than higher because you're, that's going to help you to, to move on. But yeah. as I've understand it from multiple conversations with agents, ask, you know, vendors sometimes for many different reasons, they're just kind of greedy or have too high expectations. And that ends up being completely counterproductive and they would have been better off, sold better, quicker for a better price if they'd gone with a more aggressive price to the market. Absolutely. And, you know, we've got uh, vendors who have, received offers from from buying clients and turned them down and of course six months later they wish they'd taken them and, and you know there's mm -hmm. always that you know that any market is governed by greed and, and fear you know with, depending <laughs> on which on which side of the coin you are and there's no mm -hmm. different in this in this market we all want as much as we can when we're selling and we all want as little as we we can to spend you know when we're when we're buying sure. and nothing's that's never yeah. going to change what we normally do with clients is we will say look we think this property is worth five hundred thousand uh but the thing about properties you can you can always come down in price but you can never really go up because then when mm -hmm. you go up people are going to think hang on why are you putting your price up people do that if they think they can get more they they will do but agents tend to look at it and go hang on hang on something something fishy going on so we always say look we can come down so if we think the market price is five hundred thousand, we will normally allow a little bit of wriggle room in there for negotiations we might advise to to market it at 550 but mm -hmm. but so 10 percent mark um, um, negotiation yeah, room five ten percent yeah. I, th I think so, because, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes we do actually say to a client, look, particularly if it, if it brings it under a price threshold. So if, for instance, we say, look, we think it's worth 500,000. Why don't we put it on at 495? No offers. And by mm -hmm. doing that, by doing that, it means that people who are searching up to 500,000 are going to see your property. Uh, whereas if it was at 550, they wouldn't. So you're yeah. going to you're going to appeal to more more buyers, and then it's up to the agent to educate those buyers and those collaborating agents that 495, that is it. There is no offer. There is no wriggle room at all. Um, mm -hmm. And some some people like that, and sometimes we're very successful with that with that strategy because the headline price is low and it's good. Um, sometimes you just you know you get buyers and you'll tell them there's no room and they'll still offer you know 10 percent less. So. Yeah. So here's a question. I mean, the way it works, the kind of mechanics of it, I assume, is that when people are in the market, they've decided they want to buy something. Let's say we go with this uh, example of like an apartment of the cost of soul for five hundred thousand. They start looking, and they start, you know, they start at the portals and doing their searches, and quite quickly, uh, they get an idea of what's on the market at what price. Mm -hmm. And people are not stupid, and they got, and it's very easy nowadays to see 
to, to get this visibility into what, what, what not, not in sales prices, but actually asking prices and what's on the market. So presumably people, they, they start and they make contact agents, make, make some inquiries, but they'll spend a, a few weeks or months actually looking and watching what's on the market. And so they see when something new comes on the market and they'll come to, they'll have an opinion on the price based on how it compares to others, mm-hmm. other, you know, comparable properties. And presumably if something comes onto the market that's just clearly overpriced or, or out of the market on pr- price wise, then people just, you may get some inquiries, you make it, but there's, there's no, there's no interest. There's no real interest because it's, because it's too high. The price is too high. And then they just watch, it just sits there and it doesn't change and then, until it starts dropping. And then it's kind of like a bad, it's like a fish gone bad. You know, it smells. People get put off by something that's, and this is something I've seen in talking to agents. I've seen that it sort of just kind of gives a, it's a sort of, something hanging over it's like a cloud hangs over a property and it just stays there and slowly comes down and down and people just ignore it until they get and it has to go to a price below because their prejudice is against it at the beginning and it's not like people oh well someone's going to come new tomorrow and they'll see it for the first time there is a bit of that but these things they just hang around on the market getting a bad reputation for a long time they do. And us as agents, we get a bit apathetic when we see the same property yeah. being sent to us week after week and 10 grand off and 10 grand off. You think, oh. And what, what you think as an agent, if it's, it's priced too high, you think that vendor is going to be tough to deal with. Yes, he, set his, he set his sights at 700,000 and all of a sudden it's coming down and he's going to be a, a, a tough cookie and it, it puts you off going to show it and trying Absolutely. to negotiate on it. Um, Absolutely, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, someone who's got unrealistic expectations—they're just going to that 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 vendor is going to be hard work, yeah. um, and and that hard work is a cost. Yeah, and very often we have the same reaction when a price goes up. So you know, mm-hmm. we'll 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 see. We have access to all that information, and we can see when we get a red a red arrow saying it's gone it's gone up. If, mm. some, if someone if someone's done that, it means no. Nah. Um, um, it might be an amazing property, but naturally. We become cautious and we we say, mm-hmm. why is why is that guy putting his price up by fifty thousand? You know, why? Mm-hmm. What what is motivating him to do that? Greed. Mm-hmm. Simple greed. It must and- be quite unusual though that people putting up the price. It's more likely, I guess, that especially in Spain, where these asking sales price comparables are more are harder to come by, and therefore the market is less tethered to re- real prices. Like there's no, it's un, it's not as anchored as other markets where there's much more transparency into actual sales prices and people can get real comparables yeah um, Mark, you, would, the, you would be surprised you'd be surprised there's 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 i mean in certain areas there's always little price reductions because people have become overexcited and the market just needs to correct we're not talking mm-hmm. much but no there are people out there who who as soon as they get a couple of viewings they think oh well, my, my price is too low i'm getting interest so they put that they put the price up and you know we would never advise that you know if Mm. we had a client who wanted to do that we would say look come on you know you took our advice we priced it correctly and then someone says well but my neighbor you know Mm -hmm. 15 minutes down the road he sold his apartment and mine's better than that so let's put the oh you know that becomes it becomes personal yeah (laughs) (laughs) it really does but that's lethal for the for, yeah. uh, for closing sales. Absolutely. Um, well, I don't know how we're doing for time, uh, Sean. I think maybe if we've got five, ten minutes to yeah. quickly change the subject and look at a pot news, well, uh, like a news story that's uh, that's sort of broken from the Costa del Sol, which is this um, Grupo Otero, which was a builder and yeah. developer and um, sort of had it seemed to have its finger in many different pies. That has was a few uh, early in January. It news emerged that it was in financial trouble, and all of its uh, or many of its uh, building sites uh, on the Costa del Sol were being stopped, and and contractors were going yeah. and removing their you know trying to get as much back as possible, removing materials and other things, equipment. So it sounds like this is it's a developer that uh, has is in trouble. Yep. And it had quite a lot of projects on the go. And it seems to me that it had this, this the way it was structuring its deals is a bit like the, the case of Binoc, which was another developer. It wasn't actually a developer in a conventional sense. It was sort of uh, structuring the, the purchase f- people were buying as a developer themselves and therefore had no protections. And yep. so yep. If the, is that, that's the case, right? 
Exactly. You know, the Binox story is slightly different. It's a similar, similar idea. And this is where it's it's a bit of a misnomer to to call Ontario a developer, because they're not really mm. the builder. The builders who have structured deals and dress them up very, mm. very attractively, I must say. You know, they spend maybe this is one of the problems, they've spent a fortune on marketing, their renders are the best in the business. And you know, we actually have used the Ontario products as a lead magnet. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'll be very honest about that because their renders are so beautiful. And why should we not have those inquiries for those products mm-hmm. and give them away to other agents? And but mm-hmm. we've we've never actually sold an Ontario project. Um, well, you've been we've, you've, you must be thankful for that right now, you know, because yeah. uh, there's a lot of trouble out there from what I can hear. Yeah, we we've sold one plot, but we we mm-hmm. made sure that the buyer had an option on who built the property because we right. we we could see what was coming. I'm not saying we're we're smarter than anyone else, but you know, if you see something and it's dressed up and you see the renders and you think ah, that looks amazing, that villa for you know, a 300 square meter villa, amazing sea views. Oh, it looks great. Mm-hmm. All the bells and whistles. And it's it's 800,000 euros. Wow, let's have it. Mm-hmm. And again, it comes back to that. If something's too good to be true, it's too mm-hmm. good to be true. And um, <laughs> what Otero have yeah. done is that they um, they don't buy the land. So effectively, the they have an option and the, the buyer comes along and um, they, as you said, they be, they become the developer and they assume all the rights and responsibilities of, of being a developer. And what um, Otero do is that they charge a big chunk up front with which they use that money to then for the client to buy the land. And then it should, it should give them some surplus to then start the build. The problem is that they didn't necessarily use that surplus. This is what I understand, by the way, that they didn't necessarily use that surplus to do what they should have done with it, i.e. to start the construction and blah, 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 blah. So it always meant that there was a lag, that they were behind behind the curve in terms of delivering the product with the, the payments that were coming in from the clients. And this is crucially important. I mean, we're just in the process of launching a, a, a villa developed by us next door to, you know, to where I live. We've had to go through hoops to to make sure that this this purchase is is legal that it's it's protected that the buyer's funds are protected and you have to buy all sorts of insurance policies and guarantees and what and that's great because that's what i want i want a client to feel that they're protected we will become the developer so they don't mm-hmm. have the the problems if a guy falls off the crane you know so mm-hmm. we we assume those rights and responsibilities yes we'll build the thing with the client's money but the client's money is protected and Otero never never did that. They didn't offer any protection for for a buyer. So their their model, which is called the auto promoter model, the self the self build, is not a not a problem in itself. It's just that there were there was no fallback for for the buyers. And some were lucky. Some some have had their houses built. Others now, as you said, are in a situation where they're in a, a half built villa. And the problem is because they've paid so much at the start, it means that. They're going to owe money. So a, a builder may come along and say, "Yeah, I can finish this off," but mm-hmm. it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. I don't know, five hundred thousand more than your last stage payment. So it's they're going to be mm-hmm. out of pocket. Basically, they'll mm-hmm. be able to. You know, the good thing is they own the land, they own the structure that's there, and they will be able to finish it off. And I'm sure there's going to be a bit of a bun fight between the builders as to who's going to get all these contracts. And you know, but they, they will be out of pocket. Some more than more than others if they want to if they want to finish the bill and you know what it's a really sad state i asked the lawyer the other day i said i have to be careful what i say here but you know do you think the guys behind otero have been just negligent just couldn't manage the business and the cash flow or do you think they've pilfered some away and his answer was we don't know you know Mm -hmm. and and i think that's that's right the only people who know are the the guys in otero we mm. were always suspicious because of the amount of money that was going into the marketing and the and the the paying agents and stuff like that. And you think, hang on, these these figures just can't can't work. And the problem is, over the last two years, of course, is we've had an increase in the cost of everything, uh, including mm-hmm. building yeah. build, including building costs. And if you're buying mm-hmm. a villa, at, I don't know, with a final building cost of one point five million, and actually it's going to cost the developer. Yeah, you know, it's, it's going to eat into their margin. So mm-hmm. Otero, Otero have been going to clients midway through construction saying, sorry, Mark, but that villa that we promised and that stage payment that we need now is 250000 We actually need 350000 because the building costs have gone up. Mm. You know, it's no mm. way to run it. It's no way to run a business. You've got to, you know, we're, we're going through the process at the moment. You've got to provide a safety net for yourself. Mm-hmm. And you've got to, you've got to make sure that the clients are, are protected. And I don't think Otero did either.
um, mm. either either of those things. And it could only go one way. It could only run out of money uh, mm -hmm. because they, they just weren't managing the cash flow from what I can mm. see, from what I can yeah. see. I guess it's worth pointing, it's worth stressing that Otero was not a developer. It was doing this, it was offering a self build model whereby they were basically just, oh, we're the service, you, you're the developer. You've got the land and you're building your own villa, but we're just doing it all for you. And it's kind of a service fee, but that badly managed. Um, they, if they end up going under holding a lot of it with a lot of your stage payments, you, you end up, although it, in your own the title to maybe the land and what's the, the, the you know, the, whatever's been built to that moment, you still could be out of pocket for quite a lot of money. But traditional developers in Spain, it's nothing like it used to be today. If you buy from a, a developer, you will get all the guarantees whereby you know if the developer doesn't deliver you'll get your money back because there's a bank guarantee and and we've seen it even people who lost their off-plan payments in the boom years have managed to recover the money many years later and, and and it was a sort of not exactly a consolation but i've seen quite a few recover money with interest paid 15 years later from the banks from the developer's bank so exactly exactly if you're buying I mean, from a developer you shouldn't be in any it, it, there's there's not much risk this is a different story yeah i mean you know my advice to clients is always you know to hire a good lawyer and to make sure that if you're buying uh off plan uh that you are protected either by a bank guarantee or by an insurance policy that the developer has has taken out. For instance, the project we're doing, we're taking an insurance policy because we want to we want to have access to the client's funds to to do the building. Mm -hmm. But what it means is that if we disappear into the sunset, all those monies are refunded. And this insurance policy is not it's not cheap. It's mm. anything between fifty thousand and a hundred thousand euros. So, and I'm not adding that on. It just eats into our margin. But it's something we have to do because I don't want to get embroiled in contagion around this Otero issue. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other option is the bank guarantee, which is what a lot of the big, big developers use because they don't necessarily need that cash to to do the build. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, e you know, e either way, the, the banks are in control of the money. The bank, you know, like I have to open a special account with a bank that's nominated by the insurance company. And mm -hmm. I can't I can't go in there and use that money to market another villa or mm -hmm. buy a buy a BMW. The, the banks are in control. The banks are basically saying, no, 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 this, this isn't your money. And I have to prove if I want to spend anything, I have to prove with receipts and invoices and, and mm -hmm. uh, quotes. Just, just to justify it. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And so there are protections there. And it's just a shame. It's a shame for the market, because like you said, it's actually a very safe time to to buy off plan. I found it actually safer to buy off plan here than it, than it ever was in the UK. Because of those bank guarantees, those insurance policies, and you know your money is is protected. But I think the the Otero thing. I think they got a they got greedy, and I think their buyers got mm -hmm. a little bit greedy because they they saw something that was a great price, blah, 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 and it's just it's come come back and, and bitten them, unfortunately. Hmm. Well, I hope it doesn't do. You know, it, these kind of things they 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 they're not good for. You know, they don't. Uh, they tend to be. Some people say, well, there you go, that's Spain, you know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, um, yeah. it's not Which good for the market, but hopefully the damage will be limited the fallout. Yeah, I think that that to say that is is lazy, um, because, you know, as, as you know, Spain has changed in the in the Wild West. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have, mm. uh, I wouldn't have, you know, not expected it. But, but I think, you know, things have changed, things are. And if you get a good lawyer, you know, things are much, much easier and more transparent. And that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this, because, you know, there's no point hiding under a rock. You know, this is this is happening, and mm -hmm. buyers will find out it's happening. And yeah, it's not great for the industry. It's not great. It's probably cost me hundred thousand euros because I'm having to get this insurance policy. But mm -hmm. do you know what? If it cleans up the industry as a whole, then great, because we need mm -hmm. buyers to have confidence. And it's a shame that this has come along and kind of knocked mm -hmm. knocked some people sideways. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the learning points people need to be aware that when you know when it looks too good to be true, you just need to know if you're the are you the the are you taking on the risk as the developer? Exactly. And if so, then then and you're handing over payments to you, then there's this risk. But if you're yep. just buying from a developer off plan in a kind of you know plain vanilla um, structure, then you're you're not. It doesn't mean to say things can't go wrong, but you're not going to end up uh, losing you know a substantial yep. amount of money. Exactly. That's okay. the important thing. Great. I think that's covered us for this uh, this session. Yes. 
we will do. Re- we will reconvene next month no doubt to uh, chew the fat over some other issues that have emerged in the meantime but um thank you as always mark likewise sean it was always a pleasure and an education talking to you and likewise i will speak to you very soon sir Thank you.